A very good afternoon, my name is Federico Rhee and this is Inspire Talk TV and I'm here filming at The Cluster in Melbourne and joining me today is another very distinguished guest. He's the Head of Business Development at Yellow Brick Road, he's a property investor and he's also a social entrepreneur. Welcome Andrew. Thank you for having me, it's great. Absolute pleasure and honour to have you on this show. This beautiful view we've got here. Absolutely. How at can The Cluster, like it's great. It? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So Andrew, well thanks for coming along, um, I guess I really want to dig deep into your, your story, um, more, more than just being an entrepreneur that you yes. are, but really looking at the social cause of what you do as a social entrepreneur. Yes. Um, so I guess to begin with, tell us a little bit about your journey from early childhood to where you are now. Yep, so similar to you, yourself um, having, you know, migrant family and, you, and uh, you know, coming from that Italian background, so mum and dad um, come on the boats to Port Melbourne in, uh, in 1956 separately, they were children at this stage, but um, you know, obviously a, a war-torn country, Italy, it's, it's forced them to sort of rise to the occasion. That's probably where that entrepreneurialism came from. Um, my dad's always been self-employed and my mum was a, a housewife, but certainly a, the backbone and foundation of, and the bedrock to my dad's entrepreneurialism, obviously providing that support from a family point of view. Grew up in family business, um, had a great career in, in property. Um, throughout Melbourne and, and now nationally, uh, being involved in nearly a thousand property transactions. And then um, very, very lucky, you know, out of 10,000 people trying out for The Apprentice Australia, uh, got onto the show and, and won that and work, I've been working with Mark Burris since I was 24, just turned 31, so eight years in, uh, in January. And um, Mark really, Mark Burris really encourages entrepreneurialism. That's what allowed me to work more into that social entrepreneurialism as well. Great. Look, being an entrepreneur myself and also being Italian, I know very yep. much how that family root in entrepreneurship does does prevail does. And, and does spur that passion in you and what you do. So I guess looking deeper into the social entrepreneurship course, um, I call you a social entrepreneur. Yeah. Perhaps there may be other words around there like philanthropist and so forth. Do you consider yourself any of those? or? Look, it's, I never did anything for the titles. It was, we, we grew up in a, in a beautiful environment where my father, um, this interesting lesson he always taught us was, don't judge a man by the color of his skin or the nationality or what religion he is, but judge him by how hard he works. That was, he said, you're allowed to judge him but by how hard he works. And my dad was being a little bit cheeky and having a bit of fun. But we grew up in an environment in, in family business, which was um, petrol stations, um, where my father employed everyone, different nationalities, different religions. And what that did is it gave me exposure to a lot of cultures and the good, the bad, the ugly of all of those cultures and really spurred on that, um, you know, that charitable, that philanthropic mindset. My father always donated a lot of money to, to charity and to community groups. We, we sponsored our church and our, our school, our primary school the other day, uh, my brother and I, with uh, our Jealous Craig business as well, um, which is a Melbourne-based real estate firm. Um, so our father and mother always instilled that charitable concept to us. So it was never really a, I'm going to do this to become a, a you know, a, a you know, a, a social entrepreneur. It was that's the way that you do life. I guess know? it's ins instinctive. And instinctive, correct? Yeah. yeah, I think that's the right word. I wasn't. I was looking for the word there, <laughs> and you, you hit the nail on the head. That it was just bred into the culture that we grew up in. Yeah, great. Mm. Um, so a lot of the initiatives that you get involved in today are very yep. much geared towards fundraising and, yes. and raising money for particular causes. Yes. And uh, for the record, uh, you had recently you were part of the trek towards 1,000 Kokoda. Um, trip in, in early this year. Yep. Um, you, you've also been involved in the project Gen Z yes. uh, initiative. Just describe those initiatives in a bit more in detail. So we um, we did the Kokoda Trail for a group that I sit on the uh, a charity that I sit on the board for called Seed Foundation. We provide uh, Indigenous education around um, health services to encourage um, people in remote Indigenous communities, Palm Island, uh, Mount Isa, Townsville, and so forth, to then actually um, pursue a career in in healthcare. So obviously we've got an aging population. We've got a major issue in Australia where Indigenous people on average are living 10 years less than a non-Indigenous person, which is just appalling, uh, considering we're such a wealthy country per capita um, globally. Um, so we did uh, Kokoda with nine of us, um, raised hundreds of thousands of dollars, and it was um, a great way to create awareness 
and uh, Kokoda is very significant for Australians. So those of you who have, haven't seen Kokoda or know what it is, they should go and you know, research that in Papua New Guinea. Um, and then as soon as I got back from that, I think I saw you in between actually, but as soon as I got back from that, um, I sit on the board for a social enterprise and was one of the founding members for um, Project Gen Z, which is another great organisation um, headed up by Liz Volpe, which you've had a chance to meet before, an amazing inspirational woman, uh, where we run and run and run entrepreneurial programs in Cambodia, um, where in what we call Sunrise Village. So they're not allowed to call them orphanages anymore. They're more um, outreach programs. So a lot of the kids that are that were considered orphans and now what we do is we try and actually get them back into families within villages that are local so then some kids do stay still at the the village the mm. community that that's provided the compound effectively but there is a big push now to get them integrated back into the community so right. but we want to encourage entrepreneurialism and the winner of that apprentice challenge we run with these students from sunrise village wins uh a scholarship to either university or, or money towards starting their own business. Yep. Um, and we've had a number of kids now over the last three years start their own businesses there. So as a visionary that you are, as a business leader, what, what is it that you enjoy the most out of these initiatives? What gives me the most now? So I believe you get take nourishment four different ways. I, I believe you take it physically and you know going to these places and physically being in, in, in immersed in it nourishes you quite a lot. I think you take nourishment mentally and, and seeing what you can help other people do mentally nourishes you emotionally, but most of all, spiritual nourishment. So emotional and spiritual nourishment are, are very important in that four spectrum. And when you go to these places and you can take the nourishment, it gives you what I call the artillery to be able to take on the dramas of, of you know, first world, or well, you're not supposed to call it that anymore, but developed nations problems, you know, and, and people make a joke and they say, oh, it's a first world problem. But the first world problem is just as important as developing nations or third world problems, because the way we as uh, people that live in a developed nation deal with problems is actually gonna be the, the problems that all these emerging countries and nations are gonna have. And it's really, really important that we, we try and work, how do we learn from the mistakes we've made? And uh, how do every day we, we, we give more love and more nourishment and more happiness to the world that we live in? Because the funny thing is, you go to these developing nations and they're a lot happier than we are. Absolutely, I've so, seen that before, traveling you know, to Africa. Yes, so uh, it's, it's all about trying to find the balance and uh, really getting perspective on life. So I guess the, the greatest reward for you is the end cause, is actually seeing it from, from that grassroots level yeah. um, and seeing the outcome of happy kids, receiving the funding or the yep. support necessary for them to be more educated. So I, sp I suppose on that subject of education, yes. Um, yes, education is important, but is it overrated? Um, and to what extent is more funding needed for education in those particular countries? Yeah, well, that's, that's a really great question, actually. So I think it's got to be the right education. So what's happened is obviously in these developing nations, the, the developed countries have thrown a lot of money at it over the years. but not really provided them with the fishing rods to learn how to fish. You know, it's yep. been like, let's give them money, let's give them food. When I think the challenge we've done there is you're, you're enabling, you know, habits and behavior and they don't know any different. So when it's when we call it education, certainly it's something I always push when I go to these countries is that learning English is first and foremost very important. We, in Cambodia, we encourage the students to go to um, a US-based university and study a degree, not actually to study at the Cambodian universities, because the reality is if they really want to take advantage of the opportunities they're given, they're gonna to need to uh, have some credibility internationally and the, you know, the U United States based um, Cambodian universities provide that. I think uh, when we talk about education as well, there needs to be education in more than just a degree opportunity, but what we're trying to do there, which is entrepreneurialism. And the funny thing is, instinctively, these people are more entrepreneurial than us anyway, because they're in survival mode. Yeah, they're very so adaptive. They're right? very adaptive. So like, you give them a box of, you know, box of food to sell, and they'll sell that food. You give them a, bo you know, a box of drinks to sell, they'll sell those drinks, you know. So they're, they're very, very uh, resourceful, um, much more than, you know, a 17 or 18 year old that you get in. So I guess home. as entrepreneurs, there's always that survival instinct, and there for them, is. it's literally survival. It's survival, correct, so yeah, yeah, yeah. raw and, and real. And they just need that encouragement. So the education provides that encouragement and a little bit of structure for them. Sure. And it's very high energy, it's very high impact. Um, and then obviously what we do is we try and educate the educators 
to keep that momentum going once we leave. So I guess the sceptics listening to this transmission yeah. <clears throat> might be thinking, well, we've got a lot of issues here in Australia. Yes. Why go and extend yourself abroad when maybe they should just deal with their own issues yes. locally? So what, what advice do you have to give those people? Well, look, they're not wrong, actually. So it's, it's actually a really valid point that you bring up and something I'm very passionate about as well. So I, I was doing the Cambodia and I did work in Manila and in the Philippines and did work in, in Thailand well before I started doing work with Seed Foundation. So the work with Seed Foundation for the Indigenous community of Australia is probably only about 12 months old. And you know, that's why I did the Kokoda Trail. Um, so I think, I, think they've, I think they've got a valid point. And I listened I listen to that point because somebody did bring that up with me. They said, oh, you're doing all this great stuff in Cambodia and you've done stuff in Thailand, you've done stuff in, in the Philippines, but what are you doing in Australia? And I went, shit, you're right. You're actually right. And uh, I think it's the balance. I think what happens by going to these emerging um, nations and these developing nations, it actually gives us an opportunity to learn um, from them as well as much as we teach them. We learn so much from them too. Yeah. Um, and it gives you that barometer to be able to come back and work with the problems that we have in Australia. Plus to keep doing what you're doing, you've got to also be genuinely attracted to a particular region or even culture. Yeah. Um, and that what, that's probably what pushes you even further to, to want to help out. The, the other reality too is Australia forgets very often that we're actually Australasia. We're not United States, we're not England, and we get, we get put in that category often because of our, you know, our military alliance. But economically, economically, by Cambodia flourishing, Thailand flourishing, Vietnam flourishing, China flourishing, it actually has stopped us from falling into a recession. The reality is, is that um, during the GFC, you know, we were underpinned, our economy was underpinned by Asian money. It wasn't underpinned by American money or English money. And I think we need to, Australia politically, needs to see ourselves as a beacon or as a role model for the Asian region rather than us always trying to follow America in their footsteps. I know it's a little bit political and sure. I say you shouldn't talk about politics and religion, but the reality is that's something I'm quite passionate about. And um, not that I was a massive Tony Abbott fan, but he understood, like the one platform he had was educating Australia around the fact that we're part of Australasia and not America just because we follow a lot of American traditions. So given that you're an investor, you understand the importance of mm. investment per se, but let's, let's extend that further into words like partnerships and collaboration. Yep. How important is all of that in order to get these initiatives off the ground and actually attracting sponsors for that matter? M massively. There is, um, you know, collaboration in itself. Like, and when we talk about sponsorship, there's sponsorship in a, in a physical sense, a monetary sense, a, um, you know, a, a, an agenda sense, like, you know, sometimes- Emotional sense. Emotional sense, but yeah. just sometimes getting support um, from a particular person or organisation. It might not necessarily be monetarily, but um, them saying, you know, this person, you know, you, we love what Morello's doing, we love what Liz Volpe's doing, we love what Project Gen's doing, we love what Seed's doing. Like, sometimes that's just as important. And understand that it's all part of a journey and that uh, the people you collaborate with today might be there for a reason, a season or a lifetime. And understanding that because in the early days when we, we first were starting out, there were a lot of challenges and the people that were able to help then, they helped, but not necessarily are they there today, not for any malice reason, but just because, you know, people have got so much that they can give. And it's important that if you do have a social enterprise or a, a social cause that you really want to get behind, like, you know, we were talking earlier with, you know, some of the great stuff that you guys are doing, like, I think it's all part of the journey and understanding that you're going to get the ups and the downs and the all but arounds. But equally, you've got to be commercially aware of the limitations and the you realities. Yeah. And, and understanding what people's limitations are as well. Like, you know, we, we live, part of the challenge of living in a, in a developed nation is that um, people struggle often with maintaining the vitality and the energy that you need to keep going. Mm. Uh, and everyone's got their own problems, you know. Like so I, I read in between the lines that tenacity is really mm. key here. Yeah, so it is. In, in terms of dealing with those challenges and obstacles, what would you say historically has been one of your greatest challenges in dealing with these fundraising issues? Uh, it, it's, there's a thing called um, donors fatigue. There's actually a thing in, in this world called donors fatigue and, and certainly I've, I've come across that. Um, you know, I've, I've asked a lot of favours of people. What, what's important if you, you're looking to sort of get a cause off the ground, even if it's a, a social enterprise cause where it's a business idea that's going to give back to the community in some way, shape or form, it's about um, continuously looking for the commercial viability of it. So if we want to take our philanthropic hat off for a minute and say, well, how do I help more people? Because 
Oprah Winfrey um, once surmised when she was interviewing uh, Lance Armstrong that if, you make, if you're a good person and you make lots of money, you become a better person because you can help more people. If you're not a good person and you make lots of money, it just generally, uh, you know. There is a dead end to that. Yeah, well, it highlights the kind of person that you are. Mm. And the reality is, is that, um, you know, the, the more successful, you know, if someone would deem me being successful that I've been able to be, the more time it's allowed me to spend on these social enterprises and so forth, or the more time it's allowed me to spend on causes that I'm, that I'm passionate about. Um, so. Don't go into it blindly. The piece of advice is probably don't go into it blindly. Don't be a dreamer only. Don't be a dreamer, correct. You know, and I've had to say this to friends before. I said, you're doing so much good stuff, but you're going to go broke doing it. Yeah. And I'm like, I, you know, I don't want, don't want to see that. You need, so still need to. How much time do you allow for such an initiative to, to work within, from startup average? Look, I'm still, I'm still battling on ideas that I had 10 years ago. Okay. You know, so I'm probably not a good role model or example around that. So there's, there's projects that I've uh, always chipped away at um, and, and causes I've always been a part of. Um, like I, we did an event for Her Heart, um, uh, Dr Linda, on Friday with uh, Yellow Brick Road and Macquarie Bank. It was, it was a women in finance event. And I've been working with, with Linda as a bit of an ambassador role for her and introduce, introducing her to some good people for her cause um, for you know probably five years. And she's, she said to me on Friday, like now it's sort of come together, but for five years she's been battling it. Sure. And, and she was self-funded and she yep. was going through all the drama of it all. And I can relate to that again. I know, you can. So, I know, so, so look, you, um, we have a lot of listeners out here that, that are uh, aspiring entrepreneurs, yes. uh, innovators and philanthropists and so forth. What advice would you give them in terms of the realities of what they would be facing in the first couple of years? Well, I think, first of all, more is lost with indecision than wrong decision. Okay. So I think um, a lot of people, like you don't want to die and have not had a crack. Mm. Like, and you don't want to get to a space in a time in your life where you're going to regret that you didn't have a go. So just so, give it a go. Give it a go. Worst case scenario, you fail. Who knows? You might actually spark something in someone else. That, fail that is a good thing in our language, isn't it? It is. It's yeah. a stepping stone to success, or it's a great learning curve for something bigger and greater. You know, yeah. and, and we're still young. Like you know, the, you know, a child born today is going to live to 100. So, when you, you know, in your 20s or 30s or 40s, even your 50s or 60s, you still got another 20 or 30 years to have a crack and yeah. see how it works out. You know, so more is lost with indecision than wrong decision. And probably the biggest thing um, is that resilience that we spoke about, you know, that um, you're going to get a lot of no's. But probably the last part, it's probably a three-pronged attack, which is, you know, have a crack, resilience, but also go into it with some commercial mindset as well. And don't be afraid of asking people the, the, the true realities and get feedback. Like, you know, when people say, oh, look, it's not, I don't know, I think it's going to fit for me. Well, ask them why. Like, yeah. you know, what, why isn't it appealing enough to, to, for them to get involved? Look, and, and listen to that advice. From experience, for every 100 attempts, 99 are uh, setbacks. And, Correct. And that one is worth fighting for. Yeah. So keep fighting. It's so like when I used to door knock, when I first got into real estate, when I was like 18 years old, I, yeah. I used to door knock in, in Newport, in Melbourne. And I remember door knocking, and I remember my first day I did it, I door knocked like 200 houses. And I was like, hi, oh, you know, knock, knock, knock. I'm Andrew Morella. I was back then, I was worked for a company called Compton and & Green. And by like the 150th house, I was like, I don't think I want to do this anymore. And then I reckon I got to like the 193rd <laughs> house and this lady's like, was playing with her daughter in the front yard, 47 Wood Street, Newport. I still remember the address, right? You always remember the first one. And she's like, uh, I gave her my card and I was so excited that she said she was thinking about selling that I ran back to the office without getting her details. That's what I ended up doing. I was like, wow, this person said yes. I got one yes it's out of 200. Her, it's luck or whatever you want to call it. It's, it. It does happen when you keep persevering. It does. Yeah. And you know, and it's a game of momentum. So once you get started. And a game of numbers. Mm. Mm. And once you get started, I think people will start to feed off that energy. And you can see even when you're talking about your project, how, how passionate and how energetic you are. Absolutely. So let's talk about technology. Let's talk about social media. Yeah. How, how is that instrumental in, in, in reaching out further and in gaining an audience, I guess? The, the ironic part is I was, a, I was a late adopter of social media. I, uh, I was one of those people that said, you know, and this is the other thing to being an entrepreneur, you need to be able to understand when you're wrong. I was like, oh, it's a waste of time, rah, 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 rah. But now, being, being Sicilian, I guess pride comes that in. Was, it was a bit, a bit of that, I think, that, that Sicilian stubbornness kicked in. But I think what happened was I realised 
Um, when I did take it on board, and you know, with the with Facebook, I've got uh, you know, I think there's five thousand friends, five thousand followers on the my personal account. There's another five, ten thousand followers on the on the public page. There's um, uh, six thousand followers on Instagram, another I think five thousand on Twitter, and it's great because I can put something out about my philanthropic stuff. And generally, we can find you know a few people interested in getting involved, which is which is great. Um, and obviously, for people's business, there's a lot of opportunity there too. The the precursor I'll say to it is be prepared to show some vulnerability on it. Like uh, I remember one time I was I was travelling through Thailand on a on a personal trip, like a fun trip, and uh, my mate was dancing in the middle of the street in in um, I think uh, Copenhagen. We we're, were with my mate's parents and everything, but my mate was dancing with his top off with uh, they had the you know the cabaret shows and the cabaret shows are often with the you know the transgender people. And uh, one of these business people that I know he had seen it on my social media and he rang me and he's like, you should take that down. And I said, why would I take that down? And he's like, oh because it you know it might offend people. I said, well no, if it's pretty. It's a common part of their culture um, in Thailand that they have these, you know, transgender cabaret shows. Their family shows. Kids go and watch them with their mums and dads. They're not inappropriate in any way. Um, and I said it, it would be that would, in my opinion, that was me being a little bit Mac like it would be me being too strategic and Machiavellian. That I don't want people to see that I do have a good time still as well. So I say show a bit of vulnerability. Obviously, don't offend anyone, yep. but don't make it all perfect because. If you're showing that it's all perfect on social media, people generally know you're bullshit. So expose yourself. Yeah, honestly. just show what it's yeah. what it's really like, and you know, put a quote up that's a positive quote. Sometimes you're having a bit of a bad day, so you might have something there that talks about your challenges. Yep. No one's going to believe that it's perfect all the Be time. Be real. So, in terms of the technology side, just yep. one thought there. Do you have anything to sort of add to that? Look, I think. You, one, you've got to embrace it. So embrace, you know, embrace the uncertainty of it. I think number one. Number two, um, you know, Mark Burris always talks about this as well. Like he's an investor in, into a number of technology business. That technology is the future. So mm. you, you need to um, educate yourself in it. When I say educate, you don't have to go do a course on it, but certainly immerse yourself in it. And number three is I think. Um, you, you need to understand it. And when you start to understand it, you'll find more opportunities to really- Don't be afraid it. of it, basically. You know, don't be afraid of it, yeah. you know? Like, you know what's funny? My mum and dad are on Facebook now, yep. so, you know, like my mum watches everything I'm doing in Cambodia and, and Papua New Guinea and, and New Zealand and, you know, Thailand. She's watching all this, Philanthropic stuff through uh, social media, you know, and I get on. So I, she's your biggest fan. She is my biggest fan. She likes everything. She gives everything the thumbs up and the and the double clicks. So, awesome, awesome. Yeah. So looking at the future landscape of fundraising and yes. social entrepreneurship, yep. where do you think it's going to be, or where, where's it heading in say ten years' time? Sustainability. Yep. So what what the where I think the the big shift is going to be over the next um, five to ten years is uh, social enterprise for philanthropic ideas. So um, an example is Zambrero, the Mexican food chain, has a plate for plate pro program. Every time you buy a burrito at one of their stores, they provide a meal to someone in a developing nation. Um, a pair of shoes that I own are called Tom's Shoes that I got from uh, Santa Monica Beach in LA. They've got a Tom's store. So I bought a coffee that day and the coffee um, fed somebody in Brazil. The two pairs of shoes I bought put shoes on a child in the Philippines, two pairs of shoes on a child in the Philippines. The sunglasses I bought from Tom's um, fixed the eye, the cataracts of a child in India. Like, I think that's the future. Sharing the love. Correct. Yeah. And it's like, you can't just expect people to, put, to write a check anymore. But I think, so what we're doing with Project Gen Z is we're building a, a coffee table book of all the beautiful children that have grown up in Sunrise Village, Cambodia. And um, we're gonna sell like 30 bucks a book. It probably costs us about five bucks to produce out of probably Asia somewhere. Um, and then we, they, the proceeds, 100% of those proceeds, or you know, minus the, the cost of that five bucks, or 100% of the profits can go towards the fundraising. Yep. And at least we're not asking people to just write out a check every time. We're saying, well, look, why don't you have one of these books? And we can sell that, can be put in stores. and. You know, so like, I think that's the future. Plate for plate pro programs, thank you waters, social enterprise that supports philanthropic works. I'm excited about that vision. Mm. Definitely coming our way, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is, and I think that's the genera generational shift. Like, I think if you grow up, I watched Q and A a couple of weeks ago. I love Q and A. I love Tony Jones, and I, my dream is to be on Q and A one day. That's my, one of my dreams, right? To be in Q and A and to skydive into Burning Man. They're two of my, awesome. my my bucket list things that I want to. I've been to Burning Man. I need to skydive into it. So that's what I want to do next. And um, 
they had a lot of kids on there um, talking, they had like school captains from public schools, private schools um, and, and Catholic schools and um, like you should have heard these kids talking. Like they, if they got any indication of the future of Australia, like they, we're going to have it be an amazing country. Yep. And they're sitting there, like even the kids that went to private schools, they're talking about how there should be more funding for public schools. The kids from the public schools were saying, how, you know, there should be more checks and measures on, you know, the private schools on how much funding they get. And these kids are educated, like they're 16, 17, and they're talking about world issues, you know, gay marriage, um, environment, all that sort of stuff. So. You know, I think we're going through a, a, a big shift. There's a Hinduism scripture called the Yugas, the four Yugas, and we're in what we call the Kali Yuga right now, which is where there's going to be a spiritual shift with humanity, where we're going to realise that we've broken the earth, we've broken humanity, we're, we're bought into commercialism and consumerism so much that we're actually going to realise this next generation is going to be like, what are we going to need to do to change it? So on the subject of your favourite quote, yes. and then also to end up this interview around, you know, looking at, looking at one thing you could do in your powers to change the world for a better place. So yes. those two things, what would it be? Well, I have tattooed under my arm here with another social entrepreneur, Stuart Cook. We went to uh, Amsterdam and uh, we went to the red light district and we decided to get matching tattoos because we weren't interested in all the other stuff that was going on there. And we got, uh, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul, which is from the Invictus poems. We got matching tattoos in Dutch under our arms, uh, which is something that's, that I, uh, that whole poem is a beautiful poem. If no one's ever read it, they should read it. It's also the poem Nelson Mandela recited every day while he was- It's a shame you're not wearing short sleeves. I know, I could have shown it, I'll show it to you when the, when the cameras are off. No worries. Um, so certainly that is a favorite quote. Um, and then I think, what can we do to, to change the world? It's what you said before, collaboration. Yep. I think the more we can collaborate, you know, before we started filming today, there was three or four people that I think you should be speaking to because we're all, you know, finding out our path. There's another quote I love as well, that water finds its own level. You know, I think good people find each other. And I think when you collaborate and you find each other and, and, and water does find that level, there's a real opportunity to change the world. But the only way you're going to change it is you've got to be prepared to step out, your, out of your comfort zone and reach your full potential. Absolutely. So we'll end this conversation by saying that collaboration is the new currency of the 21st century. Oh, I do like that. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you for having me.